Welcome to the Canadian Youth STEM Conference 2017. Woo! engineering and mathematics are the four pillars upon which our society stands. These fields lead the way in creating a better and brighter future for all of us. So we hope that you had um, a safe trip coming here because today is going to be full of exciting sessions that will allow you to explore the many different opportunities the STEM fields have to offer. My name is Omolara. And my name is Shanak and we will be your MCs for the opening and closing events of today. Now, do you want to become a mathematician, a scientist, an engineer, an architect, or even a computer programmer, but you have no clue where to begin? That's okay, because today Glenforce STEM will help you out. You, the youth, are going to be the leaders of our tomorrow. You are curious, passionate, and creative. You have the potential to be the forerunners that will push the frontiers of each and every one of your desired fields, just like our STEM speakers have done today. But let's give a round of applause for each one of our speakers, please. So our conference has been made possible by our sponsors and our mentors. So the helping hand that kind of guided us through the whole planning and the execution of the conference is our power sponsor, McMaster University's engineering faculty. Brampton City and GM Canada are our generous gold sponsors whose advice and guidance has just been so critical to making this today's events possible. Our silver sponsors are Siemens, Toronto's International Pearson Airport, Hydro One, um, <laughs> University of Ontario, the Actuary Foundation of Canada, Delawite, and Science Odyssey. Um, we also want to give a shout out to Ivy Schools of Ontario, since Glen Forest is an Ivy school, and we want to acknowledge their just ongoing encouragement and support of our STEM team and our school. Another shout out goes to our dedicated team of student volunteers, executives, and mentors for working tire tirelessly this past year to make this conference a reality. Can we give a round of applause for them, please? Let's also... Together, we have gathered professional speakers from a variety of different STEM fields to talk with you today and share the knowledges and experience. The students that will be taking part in today's conference will be guided by their guides into a multitude of various activities throughout the day and during different sessions. The activities that we have planned are speaker presentations, if you're here for the first session of the day you would know that, organizational booths, which everybody should hopefully check each one out, each one of them out. We also have a multitude of workshops that offer soft skills and also various other surprises and speed mentoring. In my opinion, you guys should take time and listen to the engaging speakers that come here because what they're going to offer is insightful and will help you so much in the future. Engage in stimulating conversations with them about their fields and learn more. Get hands on with the workshops and learn everything you can about the inner workings of the STEM fields and also meet with organizations that are geared towards your own goals. So let's also take a moment to thank our guests of honor who have taken time to come and join us today. So that would be the Honorable Elizabeth Dowdswell, Miss Sue Lawton, um, Mr. Tony Pontes, Mr. Scott Morash, Mr. Paul De Silva, Miss Kelly Devonish, Miss Joanna Boudreau, and Miss Mary Davis. The Honorable Elizabeth Dowdswell is Ontario's 29th Lieutenant Governor after following a distinguished public service career. As Lieutenant Governor, her mandate focuses on Ontario in the world and sustainability including its three interrelated components, environmental stewardship, inclusive economic prosperity, and innovation and social and cultural inclusion. So would everybody join me in giving a warm welcome to the Honorable Elizabeth Dowswell, Ontario's 29th Lieutenant Governor. There's a lot of energy in this room. Good morning, all. Distinguished guests, 
teachers, and most of all, students. Bonjour and bonjour. Thank you very much to Glen Forest STEM for inviting me to join you this morning. I'm so very pleased to, to be able to be with you and to be surrounded by so many young people who are passionate about science, technology, engineering, and math. And first of all, a warm word of congratulations to the organizers. Glenn Forrest has done an amazing job. <clears throat> Thank you also to the educators, mentors, and organizations who are supporting this very worthy conference. May I start by recognizing that we assemble today on the traditional gathering place for many Indigenous peoples of Turtle Island. I want to acknowledge the ancient and enduring presence of First Nations and Métis people on, in Ontario and pay respects particularly to the Mississaugas of the New Credit. So this is a year of celebration for Canadians, the 150th anniversary of Confederation. And it's a most opportune time not only to think about the past and how we've grown and developed as a nation, but also about the future. What do we want our country to really look like over the next 10 or 20 or 50 years? There are two things I know for certain. One is that science and technology will be key to our progress in the future. We already know that the most economically powerful countries in the world are those that place a high importance on science and technology. We need science for innovation. We also know that the challenges of alleviating poverty, of building a safe and secure world, of reversing environmental degradation, all of those will require our very best scientific efforts. And the second thing I know is that the pace of change is only going to increase. You know, already developments in genomics mean that we can actually recreate nature. Similarly, the developments in artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, and robotics are exponential. And when they all converge, we're going to be faced with both a world of disruption and a world of opportunity. So the next 150 years of STEM are going to revolve around some very big but exciting questions. Science and technology can be transformative, but also potentially disruptive. With each potential breakthrough, we need to consider the impact what will the effects be of all these technology developments on our environment, on our safety and security, on our potential to build a more just and inclusive society where all of us can meaningfully contribute? There's no doubt that the case for developing a scientifically literate culture should be obvious. Every day we make science-based choices in our lives. We need to develop creative and critical thinkers to actually make sense of this world. We need to prepare the workforce of tomorrow and the policymakers who understand how science can actually contribute to solving societal problems. So how do we, as a province and a country, lead in these areas? In my mind, it begins with young people like yourselves at conferences like the one you're at today. In this room may be the person who engineers the next Canada arm, or the young scientist who discovers the next insulin, or the next carbon-free modes of transportation. We're very fortunate because we have a lot of good role models in this province. One of the things that we did in our office uh, to celebrate and commemorate Canada 150 was that I asked 150 Ontarians, some of them very impressive individuals whom you know, and others just the man on the street that I met in Thunder Bay, 
I asked them to write me a story of about 150 words, sort of like an extended tweet, uh, to tell me what they thought about being a Canadian in Ontario or being an Ontarian in Canada. And the reason I mention this is because many of the stories that I received, sad, funny, poignant, were really about science and technology. Just want to mention a couple, for example. I'm very enthusiastic, I'm an enthusiastic supporter of an organization called Let's Talk Science. And so one of the stories is by Bonnie Schmidt, who actually created the organization and is becoming well known across the country for talking about the importance of STEM skills. Then there's another, um, and she, by the way, introduced me to Shaftesbury Studio. I don't know whether you know, uh, they're the, the studio in Toronto that produces, what's the detective story? Murdoch Mysteries, thank you, thank you. Just forgotten that. Anyway, they have just produced a new television series called Emerald Code, and it's a featuring high school students who are devoted to robotics and coding. So if you haven't seen it, stay tuned for further development. And then there's the story of young Gavin Armstrong, who is a student who um, is taking to market around the world an invention from the University of Guelph from undergraduate students, something called Lucky Iron Fish. And this is a small ignit of iron that uh, you put in um, a pan of boiling water and actually it provides enough iron that leaches out of the, the little fish to reduce iron deficiencies to millions of people around the world, something that's uh, very seriously needed, particularly in the developing world. There are so many stories to be told, um, and of course they include people like uh, astronaut Roberta Bondar. You know, when she was asked by a journalist if she felt tremendous pressure because she was about to become the first Canadian woman astronaut, she said, I look at it not as pressure, I look at it as a time to shine. I look at it as a time when people really need to see that there's no reason why we shouldn't be doing these things. And that's my shout out to the young women in the audience today. I'm very much in awe of uh, Roberta, and so I asked her if she would contribute one of her stories. And what she did was to share her view of this province from space, her feelings and her connection to Earth, specifically to Lake Superior. To quote from her story, she says, in very poetic language, I became a twinkling light in the night sky. I looked down upon that big lake and the shoreline that had defined me, and I touched them back with awe and gratitude. Just think, your continued involvement in STEM fields opens up to you endless possibilities. Opportunities for everyone, no matter what your gender, your race, your background, or your personal characteristics. And be not in doubt about it, Ontario needs fresh ideas from a new and diverse generation of thinkers, dreamers, and problem solvers. In short, it needs all of you in this room today. So I wish you a most productive conference. You're going to have an opportunity today to hear from some impressive speakers. You're going to have an opportunity to make some connections with students from all over the province you're going to learn from each other and hopefully be motivated to lead the way. No matter what field you've chosen or will choose, I urge you never to lose sight of the thrill of discovery and the drive to explore the world and even beyond. Most of all, remember that there really are no limits to what human beings can do if they have courage, conviction, and perhaps most of all, curiosity. So I hope you enjoy yourselves today. I hope you'll continue to remain engaged in uh, STEM. And thank you for allowing me to be part of this morning 
and to uh, become inspired by the contribution that all of you will make. Thank you, merci. Lieutenant Governor. We now have with us one of our most cherished supporters and mentors, an individual who has come to our aid countless times, given us invaluable advice, and for whom we are so grateful to have as an honorary member of our team. Over the course of her 20-year career, she has led campaigns in community, stakeholder, and government um, engagements such as the redevelopment of the Gardner Expressway, the Plotlands Master Plan, and the redevelopment of the Unilever lands into a transportation hub. So without further ado, if you could all join me in giving a warm welcome to the Vice President of the Greater Toronto Airport Authority, Hillary Marshall. Hey everybody, how y'all doing? Back in the room, are you feeling good? What? You're not feeling good? I can't hear you. Come on, louder. You heard it, I'm Hillary Marshall. I work at Toronto Pearson, which is the biggest airport in Canada, and one of the biggest in the world, so we should all be really proud about that. Now, I know you are asking why the airport is here to support this STEM conference. But there's lots of good reasons why your airport needs kids just like you to get involved in STEM and why you should count on your airport to support your dreams. Now, I know this is a big room, but don't be shy. Can anyone here think of a reason why STEM is important to airports and air travel? Come on, let me hear it, just shout it out. Oh, those are good. Those are good answers, good answers. You have a lot of energy this morning, I can tell. Well, hold on now, hold on. Without science, technology, engineering, and math, we wouldn't have aircraft design. So you wouldn't be flying anywhere. We wouldn't have navigation technology or the architects who designed the terminal buildings. Does that make sense? All right. How about the robots and the machines that move bags and people around the building? You know, if you stretched out the baggage conveyor belts at Pearson, they would go from here all the way to Square One Shopping Mall in Mississauga. That's about 20 kilometers. Pretty cool, eh? That's cool. And without someone designing the computer system, we wouldn't be able to have automated passport checks when people travel into Canada from other countries. So STEM is everywhere at Toronto Pearson. And our airport is set to double the number of passengers who travel through it over the next 20 years or so. In fact, around the world, air travel is supposed to double. So it's fair to say we're going to need many of you to come and work at the, in the aviation industry someday, maybe right even here at Toronto Pearson. We're already one of the largest employment centers in the country, and we plan to keep on growing. Which brings me to the second reason the airport is here today. We're growing, which is good news for the 50,000 people who work at the airport. But we recognize the airport can have an impact on the communities around us. Maybe it's the increased noise from the aircraft overhead or the cars on the road around the airport. We want you to know that we're committed to sharing the benefits of our success with you, your families, and your neighborhood. We're committed to helping good things take flight by helping our neighbors to build skills and gain access to jobs. And we're investing a million year, a dollars a year to help make that possible. And I want to share one last reason why we're here. It's more of a personal reason, but I think it's important and I hope there are lots of parents and policymakers out there who might end up agreeing with me. First of all, there's something I need to confess. I suck at math. I'm bad. 
I try really hard and I'm not great at science either. Like, all through my elementary and high school career, I struggled, struggled with questions like, what's the square root of pi? Or what temperature does mercury freeze at? You know it, don't you? I had to Google that this morning. I didn't know the answer. But lo and behold, I grew up and my husband Ross and I have a 10-year-old son named AJ and he is very much a math and science kid. So we started enrolling AJ in math camps where he could, his interest could be extended or in maker programs where his love of design and building things like Lego with Lego and computers could be fostered. And I've seen the positive impact this has had on his life. But not every kid in Canada has access to programs like this STEM conference or the ability to join a maker club. And for a country like Canada, and every country for that matter, where STEM is going to help us innovate and create opportunities, that's simply not acceptable. So here's what we're going to do at Toronto Pearson to help change that. We're going to invest in programs like the Glen Forest STEM conference you're all attending today. We're going to work with organizations like Visions of Science to bring STEM programs to community centers around the city. And we're going to partner with the amazing folks at Scientists in the Schools to help bring STEM classes to about 25 schools in the airport area. We're going to do everything we can to make sure every kid in our community has access to STEM programs. So, yeah, right on. So, let me wrap up by saying how incredibly proud all of us at the airport are to be supporting today's event and the great team at Glen Forest STEM who made it possible. Your vision to bring STEM to kids across the city and the province is truly inspiring. And I am so proud to have spent the last six months supporting your dreams. And to all the students who are here today, whether you're traveling through Toronto Pearson as a passenger, working at Toronto Pearson someday in the future, or you continue to live in communities around the airport, we want you to know that your airport is here to support your dreams. Now congratulations to Diana and all the members of the team. Don't wait. I need to take a picture of all of you from the stage. Okay? Because if you know me, you know I spend a lot of time, maybe too much time, in social media. So everybody, are you ready? Hold on, I'm going to make, first I'm going to take a picture and then I'm going to make a video. Ready? Everybody, well, why are you all sitting down? Stand up! One more thing, I'm gonna make a video and I want you all to say, I love STEM. Ready? One, hold on, hold on. One, two, three. I love STEM. Oh, one, more, one more time, one more time, do it again. Hold on. <laughs> no, no. I love STEM. Thank you for your wonderful remarks, Hillary. Now, before we begin to our keynote session, we actually have a surprise for everybody in this room today. It is a very special message from, I'm just going to call him a familiar face. Hello, my friends, and welcome to the 2017 Canadian Youth STEM Conference. Bonjour et bienvenue à tous. We're all here today because of a dedicated group of students and teachers. Glen Forest STEM and I, we go back. When I met with them a few months ago, I saw their passion and drive firsthand. Et on se retrouve ici aujourd'hui à la plus grande conférence d'étudiants en STEM du Canada. Congratulations, Glen Forest STEM, and to every young person in the room. You're all curious, creative, and have limitless potential. And it's up to you to lead our country in an increasingly tech-driven and digital world. 
So first, you have to equip yourself with the necessary skills and knowledge. Being here today is a great start. If you haven't already, learn to code, build a robot, play around with data, take those extra science and math classes. You may just deliver the next great breakthrough in STEM. No matter what, you'll be prepared for good, in-demand jobs and ready for the future, your future and Canada's future. All right, so we are incredibly grateful to have the support of the Right Honourable Prime Minister of Canada, Mr. Justin Trudeau. Much like our Prime Minister's vision for a generation of more passionate students, we are joined today by some incredible keynote speakers who share this same drive and hope for youth. STEM really aims to make the world a better and more sustainable place to live. Now David Miller, he truly lives and breathes this passion. He is the President and CEO of the World Wildlife Fund, also known as the WWF. Yeah, pretty cool, right? <laughs> now, David Miller is also the chair of the, C, of the C40 Cities Climate Leadership Group from 2008 to 2010, which made him a leading advocate in creating sustainable urban economies. This was truly evident in his role as the mayor of Toronto from 2003 to 2007, where he created several initiatives, one being the Clean and Beautiful Cities initiative, and the other being his aim to rejuvenate park spaces and public spaces as well. He is a Harvard-trained economist as well as a professional lawyer. Quite the portfolio. Without further ado, let's give it up for Mr. Miller. Thank you, Thanks very much. Oh, is that for me? Thanks. Good morning, STEM people. <laughs> was Hillary awesome? Yes, she was awesome. And I would like to acknowledge uh, Her Honor the Lieutenant Governor, who is doing terrific work on behalf of Ontarians. She has a very difficult role and is everywhere in this province all the time. And it's a real honor for me to share a podium with you today, Your Honor. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you all for inviting me. Wow. So, I've been asked to talk today a little bit about what science and STEM have meant to me and my life. And so what I'm going to do is talk about two things that we did at the City of Toronto that to me show the importance of science and speak a little bit about uh, the World Wildlife Fund Canada and how we try to use science as the basis for all of our work. But in order to do that, I've got to talk a little bit about myself and my own past because it's quite relevant to how I see science and I think the opportunities that you all have today and you're going to have in the future. And if there's one thought that I'd, I'd like you to take away from my remarks, it's not just that science is incredibly important because it's our independent way of finding out the truth. That's really important. But what's even more important is our ability to use science together to make the lives of people and our impact on the planet much better. So for me, science is really about people's lives and in a sense about social justice. And it's also about our collective impact on the planet and how we need to work much better with science and with our knowledge to ensure that as humans we're preserving the planet for the future, uh, not destroying it with technologies and methods of the past. So to put that in context, um, I wasn't always the head of WWF Canada, I wasn't always an economist, I wasn't always a lawyer, I wasn't always a politician. I started out as a little boy living in a tiny village in England. And I didn't know much about science. But we actually, in that little village, lived very sustainable lifestyles. The farmers all farmed what today we would call organically. And whoever's got the slides, if you could put it back on the first one for now, that'd be great. I'll, I'll maybe ask you when to change. The farmers all farmed what we would call today organically because they didn't have the chemicals and pesticides and frankly couldn't afford them. We all had little gardens. We had a compost heap in our garden. Everybody reused everything. 
Not because we had a recycling system, but because people didn't have very much money. So it was better to fix something and reuse it. And the other thing that was left with me from that, living in that little village in England, and it was a village of about 100 people, was very dis distinct differences between the wealth and opportunity of people based on what their parents did. In that little village, my friends were a family called the Betts. So you can imagine in 100 people, there weren't very many children to play with. In fact, 100 people's the first two rows here. So everybody after the first two rows, you can leave because you weren't there in Triplo. I'm just kidding. Um, my fam friends, the Betts, their father had hurt his back and he couldn't work. So they were supported by the government, and then in England in that time in the 1960s, the government gave people a house and a little allowance so people could survive. But I saw how differently their opportunities were than another family whose father was working and did have a very good job, or my family, which was just my mother and myself, uh, and she was the teacher, the only teacher in that little village. Can you hear me in the back? Yes, yes. good. We're going to the front. Okay, now it's working again. Technology. It's amazing the technology you have at a STEM conference. People are able to solve problems immediately. So whoever the maestro is, thank you. So when we came to Canada, we came in 1967, it was Canada's 100th birthday, it was an amazing year. We had a Prime Minister named Trudeau who was the most incredible guy, well he came the next year, but he was about to be Prime Minister, most incredible guy, could make anything happen. It was a real time of optimism in this country. But as a newcomer, I didn't really feel I belonged. And I didn't feel I belonged for about five years until I went canoeing in Algonquin Park. Anybody here been canoeing or been up to the park? A fair number, fantastic. Is it a good thing? Yes. yes, did you love it? For me, it was transformative because in that park, I finally felt Canadian. So for me, from the youngest age, I've had environmental and sustainability values and also a sense of social justice and differences based on what people's jobs were and how their opportunities might be restricted uh, based on the kind of jobs people's parents had. That always stuck with me. That stuck with me in my last year in high school. Even though half my courses were math, I took three math courses my last year in high school. Anybody here taking three math courses this year? You guys are geeks. Like I was a serious math geek back then. But what I did was I used that math to study economics once I got into university because I wanted to figure out how the world worked. And one of the lessons I took away from that is economics is kind of an applied science. You're looking at how the world works, but it, math is incredibly important in the study of economics to understand it. And one of the lessons I took away from that is if you understand the facts and the science, you can change the world. So can I have the next slide, please? So, people know where this bridge is? Toronto. Yes, it's in Toronto. I'm from Toronto, okay. Humber. This is the Humber River Pedestrian Bicycling Bridge, which is a lousy name, okay? <laughs> it was designed by engineers, obviously. Isn't it beautiful? It's really beautiful. But what this bridge does, first of all, it honors the indigenous people of this, of this region. Because the Carrying Place Trail, which is the first place that indigenous people lived on the shores of Lake Ontario near here, is at the foot of the Humber River. And when this bridge was designed, it wasn't just designed by engineers, it was designed by indigenous artists as well. And in the roof of the bridge, which you can see a little bit, are figures of the Thunderbird, which has an interesting significance uh, for the Mississaugas of the New Credit and other uh, First Nations people. So the bridge honored our history, it's designed by engineers, it was beautiful, but it also connected two cities. At the time this was built, there were two separate cities across this river, and the people weren't connected. And what it has done is it has allowed an incredible connection for people. So this piece of engineering was about history, 
It was about honoring our relationship with the First Nations people. And it was about connecting Canadians today across a physical obstacle. But the same principle can be applied to other things. Next slide, please. When I was Mayor of Toronto, we worked very strongly on building rapid transit in this city. And this is the plan that was developed in 2007 called Transit City, which still more or less forms the basis of what the city is building. One of these lines is under construction, two are about to be, and there's some debate about some of the others. But the plan to me illustrates how this idea of using science in the public interest to meet our environmental and social challenges can work. Because the first part of the transit plan was about getting people around Toronto and through Toronto to the cities around Toronto, like Mississauga, Brampton, and others. And some of these lines connect, actually will connect right here at Pearson Airport uh, in a few years. So it started as an engineering idea about transportation. But it's an also an environmental strategy. Because if you live in a city without great public transit, you cannot, uh, you're forced to use a car, which has significant negative impacts on our planet because of the pollution and the contributions to climate change. It was also a strategy to think about including people in the city. Because when these lines were planned, one of the key criteria was, where are the busy bus routes? So who takes the bus? Right, good. And lots of people take the bus because driving a car is expensive, parking is at work is expensive, or they have no choice. So what these routes do is replace bus service with rapid transit routes at grade on rail. And so they give people an opportunity who might be forced to take the bus because they can't afford to drive a car to have much higher order rapid transit. So by using good science, and good thinking and the best engineering thinking about where to plan transit routes, you can also meet key environmental and social objectives of lowering our impact on the planet and also including everybody in the life of a city, not some, just some people who are lucky enough to live near a subway stop. Next slide. So I'm applying these principles in my current role in leading the World Wildlife Fund of Canada. We just did a study with all the World Wildlife Funds around the world. There's over 100 of us in 100 different countries. And the study shows that since 1970, so since I've been in this country as an immigrant, since 1970, more than half of the population of wildlife in the world has disappeared. 52%. That's an incredibly serious number if you're my age, because in my lifetime, we as humans, and it's our activity that's causing this problem, have caused half of the population of wildlife to disappear, and it's getting worse. We know that because of science. We know that because of the London Zoological Society, which has done scientific studies to measure that over the last uh, nearly 50 years. So how are we going to address that problem? We're going to use that science to act. Next slide, please. WWF Canada, we have 34 scientists on staff. We have a couple of lawyers. Being a lawyer is not a bad thing. It's not a scientist, but it's a good thing. We've got MBAs, engineers, we've got specialists. That's our team. And that team is taking this important science and using it in ways, using that knowledge in ways to help diminish our impact on the planet so we can have a planet that thrives, not just for my generation, but for your grandchildren's generation and their grandchildren's generation. And I'll give you one little example. When Canada was first visited by Europeans, the cod fishery off Newfoundland was so plentiful that the sailors wrote they could walk across the, back, the ocean on the backs of the fish to land. That might have been an exaggeration, okay? There were a lot of fish. By 1992, we'd taken that bounty of nature and we'd fished it out and completely destroyed it. There were no more codfish to be fished. Terrible environmentally, but it also cost 40,000 people their jobs, the greatest mass layoff in Canadian history. 
and had other significant implications for communities that entirely depended on fishing. People literally left communities. They died. We're a wildlife fund. We're using our scientists and our knowledge today to work with those communities to help bring back the cod fishery in a way that's sustainable so that we can ensure that people are working and that nature is protected because that works together. Next slide, please. That wouldn't be possible without the science and the knowledge. So by being interested in STEM, whatever aspect, whether you're a math geek like I once was, an economist, an engineer, a social scientist, you can actually help make massive change. You can do things that will result in people in small communities in Newfoundland actually being able to have a job and an income. You can do things that will help change our planet for the better, whether it's building a bridge, a transit network, or using that knowledge to make sure that what we do has as little impact as possible, just like the people of the little village in, in England I'm from, called Triplo, outside Cambridge. You have an amazing opportunity, and I know a lot of you are doing those things today already. I encourage your interest in STEM. It can make an incredible difference to our country, our province, and our planet. And I really appreciate you allowing me to have a few words today and being invited to this conference. Enjoy the rest of the day, and good luck. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. David Miller. Your words regarding the impact of humans on this world are truly devastating, but I'm glad to know that those of you in this room today can really use the aspects of STEM to help solve those problems. And so, I'm hopeful. Um, we would now like to start by introducing our second keynote speaker for today, Dr. Heather Shudan from McMaster Engineering. A chemical engineer and a world-renowned expert in ophthalmic biomaterials, Dr. Shudan is heavily involved with the engineering of new technologies and drug formulations to help improve the delivery of eye medication to the front and the back of the eye. Dr. Sheardown is a Tier 1 Canadian Research Chair in Ophthalmic Biomaterials and Drug Delivery and a Fellow of the Canadian Academy of Engineers. She is also the Scientific Director for the 2020 NSERC Ophthalmic Materials Research Network. With that, we'd like to introduce to you Dr. Heather Sheardown. It's a pleasure to meet you. Pleasure to meet you too. Nice to meet you. All right, guys. So those are really hard acts to follow, I have to say, sitting listening to the presentations. Um, I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to tell you my story. And some of the things that we've been trying to do using our knowledge of STEM to help make the world a better place. And my focus is on healthcare. So I'm an engineer. But I'm an engineer who always was interested in medicine. And uh, the title of my slide there is C2020. So now I'm running a group that's called C2020. It's a pun, in case you hadn't figured that out. Uh, so the idea is that you're able to see 2020 and kind of taking all the people in the world that are blind and, you know, can we fix that? So could I have the next slide, please? So. I am a professor at McMaster University, that's my main job. Um, being a professor, you guys probably have some idea of what professors do. We teach lectures, we interact with other professors, you know, you, you see the pictures of the stodgy professors sitting in the, the rooms, the libraries, smoking their pipes and, you know, thinking about stuff. Could be science, could be not science, doesn't really matter, but they're thinking about stuff. So that's part of what I do. But one of the things that, that has really driven me forward is the idea of discovering something that might actually treat somebody. So I'm an engineer, but I love the idea of somebody benefiting from all of the stuff that I do. And Having an engineering background, having an interest in science, 
has led me in all kinds of different directions. And I'm going to tell you about some of those directions. But one of the most fun directions that we've worked on over the last couple years is we've started a new company. So hopefully it'll become a big company and I can hire lots of you you guys, when you're finished your STEM educations, and you know you can help us to move things forward. Um, but what we've done is we've started a company to try and move something from the academic realm, where you've got the stodgy professor sitting in the library smoking his pipe and thinking about things, to actually treating somebody's eye and having a patient who has an eye disease benefit from the things that we do. So, next slide, please. So, as Mr. Miller was saying, I come from pretty humble beginnings. I grew up the daughter of a railroader. So, in case you don't know, railroaders ride on trains. And, you know, we used to tease my dad. That was what he did. He rode on the train. Um, he rode from here to there, got off, rode back, kind of thing. And my mom was good at math. She was a bank teller. I was the first person in my extended family, in my entire family, to ever go to university. I grew up in Gravenhurst. That's an area of the province that STEM is really underserved. So, you know, I'm, I'm always encouraging my students who work in Let's Talk Science and that kind of thing to go to that area and get the kids from that area excited about STEM as well. So I decided I was going to do engineering. And I decided I was going to do engineering because I didn't know what else to do. I liked math. I liked science. I liked French. I liked history. I even liked English. I was good at all of them. And my French teacher actually accused me of going into engineering because there's way more guys than girls in engineering, or at least there was at that time. Uh, so. You know, he accused me of going into engineering because I really needed to find somebody to, who would put up with me. So I decided to go into engineering. And that was one of the best decisions I ever made. I'm so glad I did that. It worked really well for me. Um, and then I went on to do my PhD. So not only am I the first person to go to university, but I'm the first person to never leave university. <laughs> I've been there forever. I've been in university since I was 18 years old. I've never left. So I've got pictures of McMaster and U of T there. They look surprisingly similar. Not all universities look like that, but to uh, give you an idea. OK? Um, so next slide, please. So what do I want to be when I grow up? I don't want to grow up. but. I decided to study chemical engineering, and lots of you guys, because I know that chemistry sometimes scares people. I know that, I know that, you know, there's probably lots of you out there who think chemistry, wow, that's really cool, and others of you who think chemistry, like, that's the worst science there is. So I decided to do chemical engineering, and kind of the best way to differentiate between science and engineering is Breaking Bad. How many of you guys watched Breaking Bad? How many of you guys loved Breaking Bad? It was pretty awesome. Okay, so when, uh, when Pinkman, Pinkman and Heisenberg started, they had this trailer, right? That they were doing all of their cooking in. They were making their meth in that, that trailer. And it was a little lab. That's what a chemist does, is he tries to take things and make something. Make something new, make something better. What the engineer does is then at the end, remember when they had the backing of the, the guy who ran Los Polos Humanos? And he gave them this great big pilot plant and all this fancy equipment and they could make it in bulk? That's what chemical engineering is. So taking the knowledge that comes from a chemist, and you don't have to know any chemistry to be a chemical engineer. I, I actually like chemistry, but lots of chemical engineers hate it. Uh, so takes that knowledge and makes it into something that then you can sell to the world. And this is a, you know, this is kind of a hokey example because I'm hoping that none of you guys are, are into this kind of stuff. But all kinds of things. So production of everything that you guys consume. Production of the makeup that you put on in the morning for the girls. Production of the food that you eat. 
that's processed in any kind of way, production of plastics and all of that kind of things, that's an engineer. So that's the difference between an engineer and a scientist. Okay, can I have the next slide, please? So they asked me to tell you what a day in the life was of a professor of chemical engineering who's trying to start a business. And the answer is I can't tell you what a day in the life is because some days I get to come to awesome conferences like this and speak to all of you guys. Sometimes I'm stuck in meetings all day. Sometimes I'm in front of audiences of undergraduate students and teaching them stuff and trying to, trying to get them excited about the material that I'm trying to teach them. All kinds of different things. But the best part of what I do comes down to the science. So could I have the next slide, please? So I have a group of 12 graduate students so those, you, you do undergraduate, then you do graduate school. I have a group of 12 graduate students. This summer I have a group of 12 undergraduate students in the lab. We call them ducklings because they kind of follow us around. Um, and we tackle problems. So one of the problems that we've been tackling is dry eye disease. So any of you guys ever wear contacts at the end of the day, kind of want to scratch your eyes out because they hurt so much? That's what dry eyes feel like. And a significant percentage of the population has dry eye disease. And how it's treated is by putting drops in your eyes. Now, how many of you guys just love putting drops in your eyes? Favorite thing to do ever. And it always, it, it always goes in. It never falls out onto your cheek. It's always in there. How many of you have ever tried to put drops into the eyes of someone else? A little kid, impossible, right? Even an older person, I had to put drops in my mother's eyes last week, I thought I was going to kill her. Because she just would not sit still. You know, and I do this for a living. I mean, I put drops into eyes all the time. So, we've, we've kind of developed a system, a better eye drop. And that's what this company is. And this came out of some research, some science that one of my graduate students did. Came up with this really cool technology to make a better eye drop. Could, could I have the next slide, please? So the eye drop sticks to the front of your cornea. And that sounds kind of horrible and painful, but it actually isn't. It doesn't hurt at all. The particles are so tiny, so that's one of the things that scientists allow us to do. We can make things that are so small that you don't even know they're there. So instead of having an eye drop where you've got something dissolved in water, we've got these little packets that are dissolved in the water and these little packets stick to the surface of your eye and they last on the surface of your eye for days. So suddenly, instead of putting eye drops in once a day, we're putting them in once every couple days, once every three days, once every four days, which is way better than having to pry that little kid or that old person's eye open and stick that eye drop in three or four or five times a day. Can I have the, oh. We're there. Yes. Next slide, please. So now I come to business. And my background in STEM has really helped me to develop a business portfolio and, and understand business. Because I understand math. And a lot of it's just math. Right? A lot of it's, you know, how much money do you have? How much money do you need? Can you estimate? how much you're going to need to make this or to make that. So what we want to do is take this eye drop packet and de-risk it. So we're doing scientific studies, we're doing business studies, we're doing all of that kind of stuff. So having a STEM background has led me to all kinds of other things. So it doesn't mean that you're going to stay in STEM, but what it means is that you have the knowledge of the STEM fields that will allow you to then make that difference. Can I have the next slide, please? So you're actually going to see Fran this afternoon, one of the graduate students who's been working with me on this project. But it's been me and two graduate students. So I'm the old person on the team. And it's two really young people who have lots of energy, lots of enthusiasm. And we, when we make lots of money, then I want to hire some of you guys. OK, can I have the next slide, please? Oh, we'll skip that one, too. All right, so I was asked to talk about what I liked and disliked about my career. To be honest, I love almost everything. 
I love my grad students. I love talking to them about their discoveries. I love sitting down and looking at their data and trying to figure out what it actually means. I love problems. So I love it when one of the ophthalmologists that I work with comes to me and says, what can we do to solve this problem? Because then I can think about it and think, how do I apply science to solving that problem? What I don't particularly like, I don't particularly like meetings. <laughs> That's about all. Otherwise, I really do love everything that I do. I get to travel the world. I get to talk to interesting people. I get to talk to young people like you and interact with young people who have really great ideas. And one thing I've learned is that you need to really listen to the young people. Because you guys sometimes have a, a slightly different perspective on things, but that slightly different perspective can make all the difference in the world in terms of making something that works versus something that doesn't work. Okay, can I have the next slide? Okay, so I think this is the, the final thing. Um, you guys are the future. You guys are what is going to make a difference. And every single person that has stood up here has said that. You guys coming to this conference is a real indication that Canada is going to be strong in this area. That our future is really bright based on the fact that we have 1,200 kids sitting in an audience in a room in Mississauga, Ontario that are interested in solving the problems of the future. And the problems of the future are going to be solved by science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. That's it. Thank you. Um, thank you for your very insightful presentation. I just want to say that we learned a lot, especially it was amazing to hear about your story and how you came about to your career. Um, so thank you so much. Again, we'd like to thank all the speakers that we had for our opening ceremonies. Can we give them another round of applause? And with that, we bring to close our uh, opening ceremony. So if you guys don't mind, can you just please stay seated? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We're actually going to start our closing ceremony right now. We hope that everybody had a great time. Oh, wait, sure. We hope everybody had a great time in today's conference. And as well as learn as various new things about fields in STEM and careers. We would like to thank all of you for actively engaging in today's conference. And we, want, we hope that you have, well, this has been a meaningful experience for you and that you've and been inspired by the professionals that you've heard from today. So I would now like to thank, or welcome to the stage, MP Peter Fonseca and Ward Councillor Chris Fonseca. Before they come on stage, I'd like to say a few things. MP Fonseca actually represents the Mississauga East Cooksville community since 2015. He has also represented Canada as an Olympic athlete before, and he is now a member of our provincial parliament. Our our ward councillor, Chris Fonseca, is actually the, the counselor of our school's riding, Ward 3 in Mississauga, and she is a champion when it comes to community service. She has supported student-run orga organizations such as Glen Forest STEM for a numerous amount of years, and they both have been invaluable to the making of the 2017 STEM Youth Conference. Everybody, another round of applause for them. Thank you. Well, hello and good afternoon, everyone. How's everybody? Wow. Chris and I, we are so excited to be here. To see this uh, hall filled with so many bright women and men is, uh, is truly exciting for us. And to see the, uh, the Canadian Youth STEM Conference, you know, hosted by Glenn Forrest, who have put this all together, to see how big and you know, how, how amazing it has gone. Every year it gets, just gets bigger and better. And when we walked in, we were talking and we got to see there was, you had so many uh, corporate sponsors 
Awards, but they're all here also looking for kind of the best and the brightest. We had uh, government was representative. We had not a lot, a lot of not-for-profits. And it's great to see that they just want to really tap into the potential that we see in this room, all the young people. So this is truly, truly exciting. I know everyone's really been enjoying themselves, having an amazing time. Those I've spoken with, enjoying the programmers and the speakers and all the activities. Uh, I want to start by both thanking and congratulating Diana and the entire Glen Forest STEM team, the executive team. Yeah, give yourselves a hand of applause, a big applause, yeah. You know, you put this together in March, five of you, five of you came to, uh, to my office. I was so impressed, not just by your presentation, but also by your enthusiasm for STEM and their knowledge and their passion, but the opportunities that they wanted to provide to everybody in this room and right across Canada with STEM, to all our youth. That's exactly the reason all of you are here today, because this group has put months and months of dedication into making today day possible. They've shared their passion for STEM with youth like you, but they've also shared their passion with elected officials just like us. And even just a few months ago, you probably know, they had the opportunity to visit Ottawa and present to our Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, at Parliament Hill. They've... Very exciting, very exciting. And they've made it clear to our government that they want support in making education and work in STEM acceptable and accessible to all youth. And that's why our government is investing $50 million to be able to put into STEM and to get more of our youth and uh, programming and coding in our schools. So thank you very much for all those efforts. In this budget, we introduced $50 million for STEM. Glenn Forrest, the effort that you've had put into that and making that possible is nothing short of astounding. Let's give all the organizers, all the volunteers, a big round of applause. Now, as we've been walking around here today, we've already learned so much about STEM. There's always something new, something more to learn, from classrooms to conferences like this one and even all the way to Parliament Hill. It seems like everybody is talking about STEM. Science, technology, engineering, and math. But why is that, we ask ourselves. To me, the answer lies in an idea that our government believes is essential to our success. Economically, politically, culturally, and that's innovation. STEM is always at the forefront of research, of healthcare, of construction, and even of democracy. It's at the forefront because STEM is about innovation at its core. Innovation is not just exciting, it's important. It's how we learn to make our homes safer, make people live longer, and protect our environment. STEM creates well-rounded, critical thinkers like you who solve real-world problems. So whether you end up being an artist, or a doctor, or an engineer, or a teacher, learning about STEM is never a bad idea. What do you think about that, Christina? Hmm. I don't know what she's going to say no. here. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's absolutely fantastic to be here with you today. Um, and just to Peter's question, so just so you know, as husband and wife, we don't always agree on everything at home, a little secret. However, one thing that we do agree on wholeheartedly is Peter's last statement about STEM. Uh, this year marks Canada's 150th anniversary since Confederation. And innovation in STEM is actually no new idea in Canada. For the past 150 years, Canada has been home to incredible inventors. Alexander Graham Bell and the telephone, Elijah McCoy and his several patents involving the lubrication of steam engines, James Namesmith who gave us the game of basketball, and we've also been home to incredible innovators in healthcare, like Frederick Banting, 
who discovered insulin, and environmentalists like David Suzuki. And of course, innovation in STEM would not be possible without Canadian women like astronaut Roberta Bondar and Irene Ochida, who has made incredible breakthroughs in Down syndrome research. And in the city of Mississauga, and right here in the region of Peel, we are also home to very thriving hubs of STEM innovation, innovation and research. There is no doubt Canadians have always been innovators at home and around the world. And Canadians always will be. Do you know why I know that? That is because there is a room filled here today with Canada's innovators and future innovators, all of you. Each one of you who is here because of your interest in STEM is part of the reason that we are going to be a country and continue to be a country, a city, a province, and a region that is able to solve problems today and not afraid of the challenges that are in store for us tomorrow. As a city councillor in the city of Mississauga and a region of Peel councillor, as member of parliament for Mississauga East Cooksville, we want you to know that it is you that gives our governments hope and inspiration when we are making decisions, whether around a council table or whether in parliament. These decisions that impact all of us in the city of Mississauga, the region of Peel, the province of Ontario, and the entire country. You are shining examples of upholding Canadian values and pioneering drive. You are also upholding the, the foundational pillars in our city of Mississauga of move, belong, connect, green, and prosper. So we look forward to seeing what all of you will accomplish for yourselves and for your communities, for our communities, as future leaders in science, technology, engineering, and math, or whatever the future may hold. If you dream it, you can believe it. I want to give a special shout out to Sean Slack and the City of Mississauga staff that I know who are here today um, with IT workshops and I know thank you to many of you who have given the City of Mississauga, if you participated in those workshops, some great innovative ideas that we can implement in the City of Mississauga. Thank you once again to Diana, the Glen Forest St Steam team, or STEM team, and all of the volunteers, teachers, and sponsors who made today's conference possible. We hope everyone has had an incredible day, and we look forward to supporting you in your next STEM conference endeavor. Thank you. The 27th. The 2017 STEM conference was made by the students for the students. So we'd like to take a moment now and ac acknowledge you guys, the students. As you might have known, there have been contents, contests throughout the conference the whole day, and we would now like to announce the winners of these contests. Okay, so we're going to start with the guess the number of gummy bears in the jar. So the actual number was 131. Um, the closest... The closest top three all guessed 130, so they were one off, and that would be Aria from Bristol Road, if you can come up and get your prize, Maddie from the Woodlands, Patrick Liu from Central Peel. That's not all. Okay, so then it goes Eros from Woodlands, if you can also come up and get your prize. You were the fourth closest to the actual number. Jeet Pondage from John Fraser Secondary School. Ferris Butt from John Fraser Secondary School. Lauren Agnes from Bristol Road. Neil Shaw from Central Peel. And Raman Veer from Central Peel. Congratulations to the winners. Huh? Yeah.
So if you heard your name called, please come up and get your prize. Should I see that there's a birthday? Okay, so now we will move on to the exhibitor scavenger hunt. So we have Santush K from Macville Public School. If you can come up and get your prize. We have Shavam Suri from Macville Public School. And we have Jodvir Bassi from Macville Public School. If you guys can all come up and get your prize. What a very lucky school. Okay, and our last contest was our Instagram contest. So, if we could have a drum roll, please. Okay, so the winner of the Instagram contest was Marina Petrichkovich. If you can come up and get your prize. Woo! Okay, so congratulations to all the winners. Guys, 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 guys. Photo, photo. We have also been notified that there's actually a birthday here and someone specifically came to the STEM conference to celebrate their birthday and, and his name is Anojan so we would like to bring him to the stage. Come to the stage, come up to the stage. Quickly. Any day now. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Okay, now you can get off. Now you now you now you can leave. Happy birthday. <laughs> We would also like to give a huge thank you to all the speakers that, are, that had participated in this conference today. A huge round of applause. The presentations have been invaluable to us and they've taught us so much about STEM careers. We would all